welcome in to the <laughs> our Avalanche podcast brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Head on over to DraftKingsportsbook.com. Use promo code DNVR. Take advantage of all of their great promotions. I'm your host for today again, Jesse Montano, joined this time by AJ Hayfley, only Megan Angley. I kept waiting for that screen to change to not the title card to make sure that everything wasn't frozen. <laughs> uh, and I was panicking there for a second. I was like, am I talking to no one? Uh, Jesse, AJ, Megan, how's everyone doing today? Good. How are you doing? How's practice? Uh, it was good. It was uh, warm in family sports, which is oh. a sentence I've never said. Right? <laughs> it was... Uh, it makes it's very me nervous. pleasant. It made me a little nervous too. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, old friend JJ Jerez was there, and I looked at him. I was like, "Is it warm in here?" And he's like, "Dude, I was gonna say the same thing." Uh, so yeah, so it was it was warm. Weird. It's just weird. Oh, there we go. Oh, this is going to be a fun, my, my be a fun thing all, all, all show long. Is Jesse frozen or not? I'm excited yeah. for this game. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I've had to play it. You guys have had to play it now. We were When we were pre-planning, we had to play it. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully this goes well. But <laughs> uh, let's just jump right into it, seeing as this is just going to kind of be a non-stop guessing game uh as always we're gonna kick things off with the news of the day we are gonna get into eagles who just had a shellacking of their own last night uh we're gonna get into what's going on tonight around the nhl as there are four potential series closeout games but first like i said as always starting off with the news of the day we will start local uh darcy kemper was on the ice today for the abs uh in a Full participant capacity. Jared Bednar did say after practice, he even actually got a little uh, a little prickly about it. I could tell he was kind of done uh, taking questions about about Kemper. He's good to go. He's re- He'll be ready to roll for game <laughs> one. Uh, didn't have to take any type of procedure, no needles, nothing to drain it. They just had to wait for the swelling to go down. Uh, major bullet dodged for the abs there. Other bit of big news for the first time, in, and you guys will have to help me if we even saw it at training camp. Today is May 12th, and every Av that is on the roster was at practice. Wow. May 12th. I, I believe we didn't even see that in preseason. No, because Taves was hurt. That's right. I knew there was someone. Yeah. So uh, every forward, every D, both goaltenders, um, everyone was present and accounted for. So That's amazing. It's, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, the potentially week that they have off uh, between the first and second round is proving to be uh, helpful. Definitely. Especially for Kemper. Yeah, I mean Kemper. Kemper, obviously, if he's fine, like he's kind of the whole key to this. You know, goaltending is important. Yeah, a, a hot take there as we go into the postseason. The Ontario uh, Rain probably feels similarly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the last night about as close as you can get to a uh, to seeing what a game looks like if a team tries to play a whole game without a goalie. Right. Because that was uh, that was a shit kicking, which I guess I mean we wanted to talk about practice and news of the day, but Jesse can't seem to stay on his internet can't seem if, to hold up for longer than about four minutes. So if Jesse returns, I did want to ask what question was asked in media availability that Eric Johnson reacted to, saying something along the lines of "That wasn't a very good question." I wanted to know what it was. Maybe you already know. No, I I did not. Uh, I watch all that stuff later. I don't. Usually... Yeah, I didn't watch in real time either. Yeah, no, that's not. Uh... 
I will say it's the the amazing part about having Jesse around is that he's willing to go do that at practice and sitting through sitting through some of those practice things where you get the same four questions asked. Right. Uh, are they frustrating? So, all right. Well, um, we're just going to pivot here and just start talking. We're just going to get right into the Colorado oh, Eagles. The Colorado Eagles? I guess we could talk about the Eagles. Yeah. I. Uh, you were there last night. Um, I will tell you from my perspective uh, at home and just watching people that I follow on Twitter who just, like, cover the AHL in general. Uh, if all of them chiming in on the Eagles just blowing out Ontario last night was very entertaining. It was a little overwhelming. I like to try to grab the goals as they happen, and there was just no chance <laughs> I'd be able to keep up. Yeah, especially, what was it, uh, a six-goal first period? Yeah, six goals. Some of them were weird bounces, too. I'm sure the Eagles are thinking we'll take any bounce, but some of them were a little weird. Two of them were shorthanded. Keaton Middleton had three points in the first period. It was just absolutely bananas. It's more notable who didn't have points in last night's game than it is who did. It might actually be the funniest thing to me that Keaton Middleton had a three-point first period. It, it was a bit of a joke, I, and not to dunk on Middleton. That's just not the type of player he is. Right? Yeah, he's I mean, it's not production. It's that's just not what he's being asked to do. Like that's a that's a guy that has produced what like like what like maybe fifteen points all year. Yeah, he had eleven points this year. So. That gives you an idea for him to have a three point first period. This is one of those things. One, it's why you love hockey because just Definitely. anything is anything is absolutely possible. It's it's all on the table. But also, if you're Ontario, that's the kind of shit that drives you crazy. Definitely. If I'm Ontario, and this is something Cronin talked about in the post game. I don't think anyone's really riding the high of that win being anything more significant than just a single win. It could have been a, a 3-1 win instead of a 10-1 win. It just, in a best of five, doesn't mean too much. And he even felt Ontario probably just needs to throw the tape away from this one and completely start fresh on Friday. And I don't blame them because they the Eagles have been on the other side of this. They got lit up by Stockton earlier in the season. That was another 10-goal game. And so... It's hockey. It's weird. I'm not counting on Friday being anything like last night, but we can appreciate what last night was, especially was with Olison and Ranta back in the lineup. Yeah, so I think I think that's where we should really focus the attention. It was Oscar Olison's professional debut, his first game in the AHL. Um, I mean, as their he's their he's their top prospect now. He's the Avs' top prospect. Their most recent first round pick could be the only first round pick that they make in a couple of years, to be honest with you. Um, what did you think of his game last night and, and his adjustment in game one? I was truly impressed. And I know I talk positively about prospects generally, but he's someone after seeing the season he had in Oshawa at the end after the trade from the Colts. I had serious concerns about what he would look like. I thought he would lack a lot of polish, and I wanted to brace the fan base for what could be a player that has a lot of work to do. And I'm sure that still remains true, but he impressed me so much in his debut because he didn't look out of place. He looked very comfortable. Uh, he was engaging contact. You know, there was, a, I think he was on the ice for the only goal against, and he was doing everything he could, though, to position himself to tie up that shooting lane, and he just didn't levitate and that's really hard to expect of him in his first game but everything else his speed was impressive he was thrown on the power play um, and he was hanging out on the top line for someone in the chat mentioned Sherwood so like you would expect that to usually be Mots of Sherwood and then Olison there um, Sherwood did leave the game in the second period because he cross-checked an Ontario player after a hit on Foodie that he didn't like and 
I'm not sure if there will be supplemental discipline, but I think that there will. Cronin also said it was a possibility um, because it looked pretty egregious, unfortunately. But that just means that there's probably going to be some changes made for the next game if Sherwood does get suspended. Um, and I think Olison will only impress even more in game two because he already looked so comfortable. I mean, would you, I mean, losing Sherwood obviously isn't great. I for the hope Eagles. not. I hope that doesn't happen. I checked AHLPR and I haven't seen any updates, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, but I mean, that's opportunity for Olson. Huge. So, I mean, I would, I would just say, you know, if, if, Sherwood is not there. What kind of opportunity, or if Sherwood is there, what kind of opportunity is Olison looking at? Only a better one because then he's playing alongside, you know, it's funny as Cronin referred to both Maltsev and Sherwood as veterans. And I wouldn't classify them as prospects either, but they are kind of in this limbo stage as to what they mean to the Avs organization right now. Um, but in the eyes of Cronin, they're veterans. And that can only help a player like Olison who's developing because they're very smart. And I think that's true. I think both Maltsev and Sherwood have a lot to offer him playing alongside him. Jesse? Oh, well, I saw a blink. Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure that this is not crapping out. <laughs> oh. I don't know what's, uh, I don't know what's going on. I've got, I've got. Do I sound, do I sound funky? Do I sound robot -y? No, you no, sound fine. Like you just okay. you, you were just really delayed in responding, and then your screen, <laughs> your screen is very it's very chunky right now. It's like two eighty p. So I don't know what's going on because my Wi Fi looks great. I went ahead and restarted everything. Um, so I'm just not really sure. But if every does every yeah. Well, that was really well timed. So, we're <laughs> yeah. just having a total disaster of a show today. Is it's what's all happening. Eagles. We keep going. We yeah. dig deeper. Used to signing and goaltending. Yeah, so, support. I mean, useless. It, it kind of gets lost because they scored 10 goals last night. But 34, I think it was 34 saves on 35 shots. And that's, the shots were tied. Ontario and Eagles both shot 35 times just 10 went in on the Ontario side. And so they were both seeing a pretty equal amount of action. Obviously the scoring opportunities weren't created equally. There was the uh, five minute major that they had to defend off because of Sherwood's incident. And Eustace yeah. was probably the best part of the penalty kill as a result of that. It's a, it's a lot's been asked of him quietly over the last week because he, he was in Colorado a couple of times over the last few weeks uh, as in, in an emergency situation. Right. Uh, and then flying back. And that takes away that that takes away practice time for a guy like that. You know, he's not in, in any kind of a rhythm because he's flying around. Uh, he's sitting on the bench. He's not getting uh, he's not really getting any kind of on ice reps. And to see him to see him perform as well as he has in the postseason. It's been really encouraging because he did not have a great end to his season. No, I was genuinely concerned too. I think it's Rudo who says goalies are voodoo. And he was in a bad way there at the end of the season. Actually, after the Stockton game where the Eagles were lit up 10 goals, it was pretty debilitating for him. And he has turned it around and has looked better in game one of this series in what was an impressive first round for him. He still looked solid there, but he's only looking even more confident as the games go on. Yeah. And I think if the, the Eagles are going to go on uh, a deep run here, uh, Ananen is going to have to be really at his best. He's going to have to be a big part of this. I completely agree. I'm nervous. You know, they'll have to get through Stockton eventually if that's the next step for them. And that's just a great team. So they're going to have to be firing on all cylinders in every area. So, um, I mean, I would like to transition into something else, but I don't know how to do that without Jesse here. 
Uh, so I guess just what were your, what were your, you know, as the title, uh, as the title of the pod today, what, what were your biggest takeaways from Oscar Olison in, uh, in his professional debut? I think a lot of the concerns could be a result of his former environment. And I'm extremely hopeful for what lies ahead for his development, just seeing what he could do in a professional setting with access to professional staff and professional players around him. He looked so much more comfortable than I thought. I'm more optimistic than I was before. And Sampo got back into the lineup last night. Yes. So what's been going on with him and then how, you know, what did, I guess, just what did you think of him? He did something funky to his ankle in the San Diego series early March. It was described as ankle sprainy, not ankle bony. And so the prog- like the healing process for that took a little bit of time. Um, but he looked like Sample Ranta I saw from earlier in the season. The things that he does well um, is winning those board battles, engaging in contact. He's strong on the forecheck, strong on the back check. I think the concerns with him are his creativity with production and just finding offense. Um, I even thought he got an assist last night, but I think it got taken away on the Bocage wraparound goal. Uh, But that was still his hard work in playing the body, and he's still doing that, which is good to see in a player coming back from an injury um, that he wasn't shying away from it at least. But, you know, he he played fourth line minutes, and there's still a lot that remains to be seen with Ranta. Yeah, I would say just he it's almost impossible to believe that he started the year in in Denver playing 10 games for the Avs. Uh and like just nothing happened with him out there and then he he went down to the AHL and it was like we just never heard from him again. Yeah, I almost thought he looked better up with the Avalanche than he did with the AHL, which is kind of a bold take, but he does have a lot of tools that work for him. His speed is great. It's just like the IQ for offense, at least at the AHL level, hasn't quite come together. And some of that could be changing parts and not playing consistently on one line. Yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how how that continues for for Ranta through this postseason and then on, you know, on into next year. I, I, in theory, you look at, okay, the Avs need to save a lot of money uh, on the bottom of their lineup. They've got a lot of expiring deals at the bottom of that, of their bottom of their NHL lineup. Baltsev, Ranta, you know, are they going to be able to get any of these guys to graduate and become permanent Avs? If they don't, it's going to feel like a gigantic waste of a generation of prospects. Um, uh, Martin Cal, obviously, in that list as well, but... I, See, especially because those those two guys that you were talking about off the top, like have they have already kind of like teased. We thought they were maybe already like going through the graduation process and not taking a step back, but have had to go back to the Eagles. You know, Ranta makes a team out of camp. Maltsev was a guy that was looked at over the summer as could be a part of of what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, it's um. And well, and then count, and then you're starting. You want to know, like, what's the expectation for Oscar Olison? You know, do they do they right. do they challenge him? Do they push him and try and and try and get him in there? You know, Jean Luc Foudy, I think you can still say has a year or two to go. Yeah, um, and in normal circumstances, like he would just be starting his pro career right now for Foody. The fact that he's been in the AHL for two years is going to get people antsy and be like, "Where is he?" But I don't think I just don't think he's ready yet. If if only because physically he still has a long way to go, and that's not the case for a guy like Ranta, a guy like Maltsev, a guy like Kaut. Physically, those guys are good. They can hang in the NHL. They should. They would be fine in the NHL uh, with their physical maturity that Foodie just doesn't have yet. So um, anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to. I know we have other things that we want to get into today. Um, if we can, uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, <laughs> Jesse, uh, Megan did. Megan did bring up a uh, what was asked to to EJ that that caused him to say that if that that's was- a bad question. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. So I, I actually I was gonna tweet it uh, earlier, uh, but I, I was running a little bit late to get back for the show that I've barely been able to be a part of. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no. So it was really funny because I, I give him credit because he you could tell the question actually bothered him, but he took it in stride. Uh, the question was asked, what has this season been like for you versus last year? Hmm. For those of you that don't what? remember, Eric Johnson missed basically the entire year with an injury outside of was it nine games. Game? Oh, yeah. So not even nine. Yeah, he played yeah. four games. And one of those, he got hurt in like the first period. Yeah. So the question was, how has this season been for you relative to last year? Hmm. Better. Yeah. He, he said, uh, he goes, that's a bad question. Obviously I was hurt all of last year. And then he, and then he gave an answer about like how it's been nice to be able to play this year. Uh, but you could tell, you could tell by the look on his face. He was like, bro, are you kidding me? I mean, that is, I was not the one that asked it just to be clear. I, I, <laughs> Don't usually cast stones at people asking bad questions because it's a it's it's legitimately like a harder thing to do than people think it is. Yeah, yeah. Where they're like, "Why is the media so terrible about asking questions?" But it's like right. that is a bad one. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's not a great one. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, like you said, it's it's uh, it, it's it's an intimidating room to be in. You know, those are all well spoken you know, strong minded individuals you're talking to. So yeah. like you said, I, I am never one to be like, ah, bad question. Cause it's, it is tough to be in there, but yeah, yeah. that was yeah. one where everyone was like, come on. <laughs> yeah. Let that guy back in tomorrow or what? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. There was, oh, and I, uh, th- th- there was one, um, one person several years ago and I would never put their name on blast. But uh, it was when we were still allowed in the locker rooms Remember. and they, uh, they went over to McKinnon and I, I, back then some people followed the etiquette of, Hey, if someone is at a stall getting an exclusive interview, let them finish up before you go over and start, you know, taking some of the quotes and stuff. It was a slower day. So I was standing there letting the, the person finish. No big deal. But I overheard a line of their questioning. And each question, I was like, woof. I wouldn't ask that. I wouldn't ask that. This person walks away. uh, And they were talking to McKinnon. I think I already mentioned that. And Mm -hmm. McKinnon goes over to Jean Martineau, the old head of PR. And he goes, I'm never taking questions from that fucking dude again. (gasps) I was like, oh. How's it going? How's it going, Nate? <laughs> then I had to go up and ask him questions after that. And I was like, it's keep it brief. Person. Yeah. A oh super God. professional. <laughs> yeah. No, but. Uh, Nightmare. Yeah. I, and, and, and. That is tough. The, 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 the person didn't hear him say it. So like they were none the wiser that Nathan McKinnon said they were never going to take questions from him again. But uh, yeah, I, I've taken that and I'm like, okay. Don't do that. <laughs> Everything you just heard, don't do that. <laughs> See, that's why I ask, actually, because I do like to learn when there are players who react to questions so that I don't ask questions like that. Right. <laughs> so I can avoid doing that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was not Dater. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it was not Dater. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny, like people hate on Adrian, but like, there are plenty of the players that like him quite a bit. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, Call, he He's not, not a ton of people get first named anymore. Am, al- uh, like among locker rooms. Yeah. There's, there's quite a few players that, uh, don't mind taking questions from AD. Yeah. Um, but all that aside, yes, it was, uh, asking EJ to compare a season in which he played four games to a season in which he's played almost every game and is into the second round of the playoffs. So yeah. And the only, the only games he missed were healthy scratches because it was right. the end of the year and they were like, you're good, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but again, EJ, EJ's a, he's a, he's a pro. 
Um, and he's a great interview. Like he's oh, dude, a guy he's, that you definitely want to talk to. Him. Uh, so we were actually just talking about this. Him, LOC, uh, Jack Johnson, uh, Josh Manson's a phenomenal interview. Um, the apps have a few guys who are uh, Landy's always great. And Josh Manson Ta- is fit in so well. He needs to stay forever. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, Devon Taves may be the best interview on the team. Uh, they, they've got a few guys who are, uh, who are talkers. They, they've got an equal number of guys who don't like doing it. Um, but no, they, they've got a few guys that, uh, uh, Kemper's always good too. Um, but yeah, no, so it was, uh, it was good, but, uh, I feel like, yeah, I feel like we're all usually pretty good with our questions. Yeah. I think, I think the first question that Megan asked even, uh, was met with, you know, that's a great question. Let's go. So, You're right. I, <laughs> I, um, I've carried that with me a long way. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you should. Um, but yeah, did you guys do reads while I was gone? Where are we in this show? I don't have, right. I don't even have them anymore, man. Like, I, perfect. <laughs> well, because I, I got back in and I saw a few people like, oh, AJ doing the reads. And I was like, oh, did he fucking nail him? Nope. I, I know you would have. So here's the best part about I saw a bunch of people like, oh, AJ having to fill in his host. This was originally AJ, AJ hosted this show, I mean, four or five years ago, but it was, uh, the role reverse literally on one day we came in and AJ was like, dude, I just can't do this today. Can you do the reads and stuff? And we never went back. <laughs> uh, yeah. So no, it, uh, and then I just made Rudo do them. I did them for like yeah. two shows and I was like, you got to learn how to do this. This is going to be your job now. You're just so <laughs> good at it, Rudo. And Rudo oh. was like, I don't, I don't know how to do this shit. And then he just did them. And it was, well, and now dude, yeah. he doesn't even, he doesn't look at any of the ad copy. He just knows it off the top of his head. Yeah. Well, I mean, come on. When you do them five days a week, you do the That's same awesome. ones. Like, I'd be willing yeah. to bet that he, when he, if he talks in his sleep, he does that DraftKings read. <laughs> are you willing to bet? Yeah. If you are willing to bet that, head on over to, uh, to DraftKings. The NBA playoff action is nonstop over there. Uh, DraftKings is an official sports betting partner of the NBA. And this week, new customers can bet just $5 on any team to win and get $150 in free bets if they do. If you're looking to turn some small bet into a big time payday during the NBA playoffs with DraftKings same game parlays, you can do just that. Create your own parlay by combining multiple bets like which team will win, total number of threes made, total number of rebounds, and more. And boom! You have a shot at an even bigger payout. Right now, all customers can place a same game parlay with three or more legs and get a free bet back up to $25 if one leg doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code DNBR. Bet just $5 on any NBA team to win their game. Get $150 in free bets if they do. That's promo code DNBR only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older. Colorado only. New customers only. $5 minimum deposit. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. And if you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700. We are also... Uh, brought to you guys by our great friends over at Lightshade, Colorado's premier lightshade dispensary with over uh, pr- premier dispensary with over 11 convenient locations in the Denver Metro and Aurora area coming. Uh, the Barnum location is now open one block off sixth Avenue and federal. It's the biggest lightshade store with specialty products, not offered at other locations offering something for everyone from the casual consumer to the connoisseur. Lightshade has a premium selection of cannabis concentrates, top shelf flower, edibles, uh, accessories, everything, everything you can imagine. And you guys, just for listening to this podcast, get 25% off all non-sale items with code DNVR. Shop online at lightshade.com for pickup or visit a Lightshade location near you. Do always like to remind you guys, with that promo code, you don't have to order online. You can just go on in, let them know, hey, I'm a DNVR listener. Uh, use that promo code DNVR, and you are all good to go. That's all you got to do. Uh, all right, cool. I think that technically makes this 
uh, the second segment, segment, second period rather uh, of the DNVR Avalanche podcast brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Jesse, AJ, Megan. I know Megan's got to jump at some point soon, so she's just going to bail on us at some point and not not on us i just mean like <laughs> bail out of the show she yeah. she sat through uh that awkward transition in the first period yeah. where i just started firing questions at her so perfect yeah so she's earned it she's earned the early leave uh exactly. stay with us as we talk about this next segment or if you got to be- oh she's gone she see look oh. she was just gonna just gonna bail out right in the middle uh AJ, so we were in the middle of, of some news. We got through all the Avs news, and we wanted to talk about uh, some of the league-wide stuff that's going on that's separate from what's happening in the playoffs. Uh, yeah, I mean, Cam Talbot is, by the way, in that tonight, just as a yep. this was confirmed. Uh, and we're going to get to that for sure because we talked about that a little bit yesterday uh, about what kind of happens if they do that. So we will get there. Uh, but... We have a few awards that we now know the finalists for, uh, and we do officially know the top of the, um, or the order for the top of the draft yeah. uh, coming up here in July. Is it July again this year? Yeah. July 6th yeah. and 7th, I believe. Uh, with the ja- draft lottery taking place uh, two nights ago. Uh, AJ, where do you want to start? Awards or lottery? Start with the lottery. Start with the lottery. So um, I put a tweet out there that this season was a colossal failure failure for the Arizona Coyotes. Yeah, I'm curious um, about this. I actually want to talk about this because I saw that and I did, we just haven't had time. Yep. So it actually stemmed from a conversation that you and I had about a week before or right at the end of the season. And Arizona intentionally Mm -hmm. put together a roster to lose. Mm -hmm. They said, Hey, look, we're fully embraced. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not blaming them for that. I think every team has to do it at some point where you just say, we're fully embracing this Mm -hmm. um, in order to turn it around. So they did that. This is the best direction for us right now. Yep. Right. And, and they said, we want to finish as low as possible. They put a team on the ice (laughs) to lose games. Everything went according to plan. And then in the last week of the season, they ride a three game win streak into the third overall pick. And that 32nd spot that they held down all year ended up being the lucky number uh, that came up on the lottery balls to get first overall. So for me, it, it was just to sit there and make that your goal to intentionally say we are going to go out here and lose these games and then to fall out of that in the last week with three straight come from behind wins. Bill Armstrong had to be pissed. So frustrated, man. Only to see that 32nd place combination of lottery balls come up a week later and award them the first overall pick. The reason I say it's a colossal failure is because you tried to fail yeah. and you didn't fail enough. This has nothing to do with the lottery. It's that they didn't fail enough and they took themselves out of the position to have the best odds and the team with the best odds ended up winning. Yeah. And so it's just like, holy yeah. smokes. I mean, it's it's crazy, man. Like the... They they built such a horrible team, and the team that was in the Stanley Cup final last year bottomed out so badly, so badly, that it ended up being like that. Now they're drafting first overall. I'd uh, I'd be surprised if this has ever happened before in the modern was, era. Like I, yeah. you're you go from the Stanley Cup final. Uh, they even won a game in that thing. Right, right. Like they were three wins from winning the Stanley Cup. And now they're drafting first overall. And like you for, look at from the, the thirty second spot. Like it's not like they moved up eleven yeah. spots to win. You look at you look at their roster and you're like, how is this the worst team in the NHL? Right. Just how? Like they're I can understand where you're like, oh, they're not competing for a cup. 
maybe not even a playoff spot, but that's the worst team. Right. But I think some of that goes to show you the importance of a goaltender, obviously. Mm-hmm. Having them is meaningful. <laughs> it's a good start. Uh, but also, because, um, you know, like, Carey Price and Jake Allen, like, that's a mess. Uh, that Carey Price right. and Jake Allen, they get not much for, uh, or not much out of this year combined. Um, and for Arizona, do you... Do you People in Arizona are like, oh, like Travis Boyd and Lawson Krause had like career years. And you're like, yes, <laughs> like those things happened. But those guys also played like like you look at Lawson Krause and you're like, oh, look at his numbers. His career year. Oh, well, he also played like 18 minutes a night right? versus right, right. the 13 he's played his whole career. So right. if he's on a good team. And he's playing 18 minutes a night. Is he still producing like that? Right. You know, is he still is he still the best option for you in a top six role? Or was it just that they literally had no better option? Right. And so I think it you've got some interesting pieces in Arizona that you have to make decisions on. Um, but I'm 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 with you. It's a failure that I, I think they'll be fine at the third pick. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. I, they've got seven picks in the top 45. Yeah. Like their farm system is going to go from being like right now, it's like Dylan Gunther and like Matias Michelli. Right. And it's about to get like those seven picks will be seven of their top 10 prospects by the end of the draft. Right. Right. Like they're they're going to get a huge injection of talent into the organization, for sure. But I'm with you that it was a failure that in the final week, the grand plan, the thing that they, you spend all year losing games, you spend that whole time dedicated to okay, well we made our roster so bad they can't screw this up, right? And then on the last day of the season, you're down four nothing five minutes into the game, eighty two. Right. And you come back and you win that thing, and they were already like screwed. Yeah, they'd already locked in thirty first place at that 31st. point. But watching watching that happen, I agree with you that it was a failure. Um, of a, just in that regard, look if they yeah. end up they they if they make the right pick at at three, and yeah. they get a good player and that helps them like. They're no. gonna. They would feel about that the way that we all feel about Bowen Byram and Kale McCarr, for sure. Where and and we all look back and we're just like, this is fine. Like we were disappointed <laughs> when it happened, but this is fine. Well, and, and for me, the other thing because a lot of people have thrown that out since I I sent that tweet out. Like, oh well, the Abs fell. Look, like the Abs. A lot of people forget that forty-eight point team. That was a cap team. Like mm-hmm. the plan going into that series was not. This is going to be. You know, the terrible. Worst team in the NHL. Right. And and then when they ended up there, then they just lost the lottery. That's just a, a, had Arizona finished in last place and fallen to second, then you go or third, even you go, wow, that's that's some terrible luck. That really sucks. But like it was the fact that they had a plan to be bad. And, and, and the, the kicker for me was that Montreal who ended up finishing 32nd won. Yeah. So that, that tells you, had you, had you not had this great final week where you win three straight games and points in four in a row, your combination would have come up for the first overall pick. And on it's, it's the year and it's where like coyotes fans have to be like, please, Please tell me that Shane Wright is more like Nico Heischer and not, right. you know, Nathan McKinnon, uh, Austin, yeah. John Tavares, Nathan right. McKinnon. Uh, I guess Jack Hughes is is yeah. headed in that direction. Like one of these like high end centers because I don't I don't think I don't um, I really like Shane Wright, but I don't know that he's headed in the like McDavid direction, you know, McDavid or Matthews, right. where he's going to be like it, a top five center. Is I think Shane Wright one overall? Like, is that pretty? Yeah. Especially now with it being Montreal. Oh, he's, is he frozen again? Oh no, he's good. 
So, yes, Kevin, we're doing some healing, all right? Personal growth has happened this season. <laughs> I've said his name a few times out loud. <laughs> um, but no, I with Shane Wright, like, Coyotes fans have to be like, please don't become Patrice Bergeron. Like, well, it's the same please. thing that Avs fans were doing, I mean, with in the Nico Heischer, Nolan Patrick draft. was It was like... Oh, yeah. Just as long as he's turned, and, and and again, as as that one turned out, it looks pretty much like the Abs got the best player in that draft. Yeah, well, and the best players in that draft went three, four, and five, right? You know, with with uh, Haskin and McCarr and Pedersen, right? And then it's so, just yeah. a wasteland, like it's a wasteland. So if there's any year that they're sitting around, they're like, please, <laughs> please let yeah. this be 2017. Where the best players come from, those picks. Right. Um, We have to talk about New Jersey once again having their lottery number pulled, this time moving up to second overall. Yeah. Um, And the part that will upset most people is with the new rules, you can't win the lottery more than twice within a five-year stretch. Well, that started as of this year. So that that does not count uh, the previous two one overalls that New Jersey has moved way up to get. And you know what's what's funny? People forget New Jersey won the 2011 lotto too. And they moved up to fourth when they had the old rules you're in place. Right, you're right, the old, you're old right. rules. They moved up. They won that lotto and moved up to fourth to take Adam Larson. They won right. that lotto too. So they won 2011. They won uh, 2017. They won 2019. And then they moved up to second in 2022. Yeah. Like that has anybody been has anybody been gifted more? Like even Edmund it, it, Edmonton didn't have this. Edmonton's great luck was that they did it in the McDavid draft. Well, but didn't they pull four first overalls? No, they had Taylor Hall, so they had Taylor Hall. Uh RNH. Yeah, I guess they did have the four. Because I forget Who? Neil Yakupov existed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was yeah. Taylor Hall, RNH. Uh, yeah, Yakupov and, and then McDavid and then McDavid. But but I mean, like you are getting into that territory with New Jersey. Yeah, like now. it's also it's also like the world's worst luck for Edmonton. To, oh, they get first overall in 2012, which is the worst draft class. Uh, your mic cut out. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean as you're, you're right. Like they, they won a couple of those lotteries. Whoops. There it is. They won a couple of those lotteries that didn't, you know, the players ended up not really mattering to that organization at all. I mean, the Taylor hall trade, especially with the way that, you know, it, Adam Larson ended up leaving Taylor hall, ended up leaving the place he went. Um, you yeah. know, that trade, you basically just let him go for free. Uh, nail Yakupov may have even been bought out. Um, the, uh, they traded. They they traded Yakupov to St. Louis. That's right. They did trade him. You're right. You're right. You're right. Um, and then St. Louis was like, "This guy sucks." <laughs> and the Avs were like, "Give him to us." And then they were like, "Oh, this guy does suck." <laughs> He's okay. Oh, never mind. Not great. Um, yeah, that's what I'm it, saying. 2012, and you get you get deeper into the 2012 draft. It doesn't get that much better. Like it doesn't. It's not like oh, the back half of the top ten is full of studs. Right. It's not. Like you're looking at that and you're like, well, Philip Forsberg was really good. The the Ryan Murray pick, like the dude's so nice and, and you know, all that stuff, but that's a I, I mean shit. Wow, one, two, three, all out of the league. Well, I guess Galchen Galchenyuk and Murray aren't out of the league, but I mean Galchenyuk's in Arizona. That's the uh, last stop. Yeah. <laughs> Um. Yeah, I mean, we uh, we haven't had to dedicate a ton of time towards the draft um, mm-hmm. thus far this year. We'll, we will get into it more, but we know that we know the uh, the order now, and and we can kind of start. It makes it makes projecting for the draft a little bit easier because you can kind of start mm-hmm. saying, "Oh, this guy makes sense with this team." Ooh, yeah. I think this team would take that guy, but they already have so and so. So you know, whatever. Well, in, in New Jersey winning it would have been interesting because it's like so they probably take Shade Wright, but 
then what do you do? You're going to have Shane Wright, Nico Heischer, and Jack Hughes? Mm-hmm. Right. And and like Jack for, Hughes, you just gave the big extension to. He sure is your captain. Yeah, and has a, a big extension. They've already got, I think, fifteen million per year tied up in Hughes and He sure. So, you you're just like. So you would have definitely taken Shane Wright on his ELC, but after that, then what? Right. Right. Yeah, I don't know. It would have been an interesting situation, and I mean, I guess there's a. I mean, you're 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 right. Montreal's taking Shane right, but I guess there's still technically yeah, and them off the board. Well, and in New Jersey too, you're like, okay, there isn't a defenseman right now. I would say that there's not a defenseman that you want to you want to take second overall. But do you take Logan Cooley? Like, do you go with the center? Do you go with a wing? Do you take the big Slovakian kid, Slavkowski? Because if you do that and Logan Cooley drops the third, Arizona's throwing a huge party. Like they're right, thrilled right. that they get a shot at Logan Cooley at three. That's awesome for them. It's it's always interesting because you know, you and I have had this conversation a bunch a bunch. I'm a huge advocate for at this at the top of the draft, you take the best player available. Yeah. One, two, and- three. The Probably. the only thing was is that it, with New Jersey, like you're in a weird spot, right? Like you have no, 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 like, no that's what, I'm, and that's what I'm saying. Like normally, I'm saying just take the best player available, but you make a great point of like the best player that's available when they go up to the podium, maybe not only like not an area of need, but like an area where it's like not only do we not need this, but like we need to not have this. We have we have surplus there already, type thing. Yeah. So it'll just be interesting. It will be uh it will be interesting. And you know, Arizona's got three first round picks. The the bummer for them is that their other two are Carolina and Colorado. Yeah, yeah. Uh Vegas uh does not move up in the draft lottery, so they do not have a first round pick this year. That goes to Buffalo in the Jack Eichel deal. Uh yeah. Chicago also does not have a first round pick because they did not win the lottery. So their pick transfers to Columbus. Uh, Columbus, two top ten picks. Yeah, boy, that's they. You know, and and they took Cole Sillinger last year, and then just dropped him into the NHL, and he was pretty solid. Mm-hmm. There, there, theirs was a, a really weird condition that I hadn't heard before. It was top two protected. Oh yeah, those are more common, and with the lotto changes, uh, I think that that's made, made sense. Yeah. Um, um but yeah, no, I think on? the the Chicago thing is is rough because that's a hard rebuild, and yeah. you're, you're like, okay, where do you get picks from? Do you have to imagine that they make some deals either at the draft or right before it to try to recoup a first, right? I mean, sure, but then you're deeper into your rebuild. Um, and like Seth Jones had a good year. Do you try and move him? <laughs> Seriously, right? Do you to Brincat, Taves, Kane? You start having some of these conversations. I think I, I, I wouldn't put money on this, but my my gut tells me that one of those four names you just listed gets moved before the draft. Because I mean, how can you commit to a rebuild like this and not have a first round pick? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you you can just I I I don't know how. I I don't know. (laughs) I think one of our one of the things that I want to do. Um, whenever Colorado's season ends now, if they go in to the Stanley Cup finals, we may not have time, but I definitely want to do, um, off season shows focused on like, if you were running this team, if, let's say the three of yeah. us are running a team. How would we fix Chicago? How would we yeah. fix Vegas? How would we fix Winnipeg? How would we fix, you know, if you're Arizona, what wouldn't, what would we do there? Oh yeah. They did. Uh, they did get the first rounders for, for Hagel. But I'm pretty sure the first of those is next year's. I'm gonna pull it up right now to check. Um, because Tampa Bay has traded all of their firsts, and yeah, that was it is yep, it is twenty two or twenty three and twenty four are the Tampa yeah. first round picks. So Chicago has no first, two seconds, three thirds, and then they don't pick again until the sixth, where they have two picks. Yeah, and there are conditions on two of those picks. I just don't know yep. what they are. Um, oh, the Minnesota one—that's a flurry pick. 
So if they go to the Western Conference final, uh, that's a first round. That becomes a first that's round. A first. Yeah. And then with Edmonton, a third round pick. Uh, if the Oilers make it to the 2022 Stanley Cup Finals and Keith is top four in playoff time on ice for Oilers defensemen during the first three <laughs> rounds, okay. the pick upgrades to a second. All right. Well, that may, um, you know, a nice little segue because that, as of tonight, may both of those possibilities might end. Yeah. So uh, let's pay some bills here and then we'll wrap things up. Quick little snapshot at awards and then we will take a very quick look at what's going on tonight. But for those games tonight, you'll probably need something in your hand to drink. Breckenridge Brewery is the hometown craft beer of your Colorado Avalanche. And they are celebrating the historic winning season with people have supported with the people who have supported this community through such a challenging year by gifting abs tickets to a pair of community stars, each home game during the playoffs, even the Stanley cup finals. We invite you to nominate a stellar community member and abs fan who should get the chance to celebrate at a playoff game this year, each home game, Breckenridge Brewery is looking to hook up a fan and a friend with tickets, gear to match, and of course, the drink of the season, the Avalanche Ale. Breckenridge Brewery will also donate a portion of all proceeds of sales of Avalanche Ale through the playoffs to the community fund Boulder County to benefit the Marshall Fire victims. Visit breckbrew.com to nominate a community star and send them to an Avalanche playoff game. That is breckbrew.com. Also brought to you guys by our great friends over at Evaca TV. If you are like most people in the Denver metro area, you haven't been able to watch the Nuggets, Avs, or Rapids, now you can watch all your favorite Colorado teams with Evaca TV. Evaca is a totally new approach to TV programming, and it is less expensive, easier to watch, and offers a superior picture. Service includes local networks like Altitude Sports, AT&T Sportsnet, and also comes with a ton of other national channels. So you're not going to miss any of your abs, nuggets, Rockies, uh, Broncos, or any of these national games. Evoca TV is growing constantly and adding new channels to their lineup. The service is available in Denver and Colorado Springs. Most importantly, above all this stuff, Evoca TV has altitude sports. Don't miss any more abs or nuggets. Watch the Rapids and Mammoth too. You can also ag- uh, access coverage for the Rams, DU Pioneers, and it is the best way to catch the Rockies with baseball season underway now with AT&T Sportsnet. Head on over to evoca.tv slash DNVR. Use the promo code DNVR. You'll get $10 off your first three months. That's only $15 per month for the first three months plus a receiver. No contracts, no hidden fees. Again, that is evoca.tv slash DNVR. E-V-O-C-A dot TV slash DNVR. And this is the DNVR Avalanche podcast brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Jesse Montano, AJ Hayfley here. Going to round today out. Uh, Hart Trophy was officially announced. Your three finalists this year, Austin Matthews, Connor McDavid, and Igor Shesterkin. And I'm saying, come on, Igor. Got that DraftKings futures bet? Can we, can we just admit here that the biased media got this one wrong again by shafting Leon Dreisaitl out of the award that he so richly deserves? Are you being sarcastic? Come on, man. <laughs> I saw some of this bullshit at the end of the year where people were trying to to, to gin up this, this grievance about how no, an Oilers player won't be able to get it because they play together. And it's like, shut the fuck up. They've won three of the last five hearts. Right, dude. And now right. this now this dude's a finalist again. And I'm not even gonna say like if he wins it, I don't have a problem with it. Like I'm good right. with it. It's fine. He's had an unbelievable year. Like it's acceptable that he wins. But oh when, my and, god, am I am I so sick of hearing from Edmonton people right. how they just can't get a fair shake at some of this and how oh they've got great line mates, so they're gonna they're gonna pull votes from each other and oh it's being weaponized against them. And it's like they've won three of the last five. Right. Well and, they, and they could McDavid... be on four of six here. And if they lose tonight, it's four of six with one playoff round that they've managed to win. Well, and and technically, technically, 
McDavid won it one year when they didn't even make the playoffs. They lost in the play-in round. Yeah. So they weren't even among the final 16 teams, and he still won the heart. Every every like old unwritten rule. How did they lose that series to Chicago? Dude. The, they have the two so players bad. from Edmonton have broken every unwritten rule on their way to winning three of the last five heart trophies. And they still complain. Yeah. Still complain. I think McDavid yeah. had a line mate that won the Art Ross one year that he won. Yeah. Like, it's just, yeah, he's a finalist again. Who do you, it's, it's probably Matthews, right? That ends up winning. He would have been, I mean, Shesterkin probably would have been my vote, but if I was voting for a skater, it would have been Matthews or Kaprizov. <laughs> if it's these yeah. three, it would go Shesterkin, Matthews, and then McDavid. Yeah, yeah. Um, at all surprise, no Huberdo? No. Me either. Um, and I, have, I think I the Shesterkin story was just too good for a, another guy to slip into that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I mean, he's runaway Vesna. Uh, so they did announce, have we, we haven't done any awards on the show, huh? No. Any awards talk. So, uh, they've also announced Vesna, uh, which is Shesterkin. And then the other two guys really don't matter. Cause no. it's Markstrom and Soros, Sh- but yeah. Yeah. But it's Shesterkin, Shesterkin and Shesterkin. Yeah. He, um, he, I think he, I think he ends up a unanimous winner of that award. I, I agree i agree i i think you'll be hard pressed to find a first place vote um for anyone else uh calder um michael bunting from the toronto maple Leafs, trevor zegras from the anaheim ducks and moritz cider from the detroit red wings um this is one i feel fairly confident it's mo cider but if it ended up being either of the other two guys i don't think i'd be surprised <coughs> so because that's what they uh, uh, they live in a world of grievance. I saw Toronto fans defending Michael Bunting with their lives yesterday on the internet. Um, and I'm curious, and somebody put out, I think it was Cam Robinson put out the tweet that uh, Michael Bunting is 16 days older than Nathan McKinnon, who won the 2014 Calder. Right. And he's now a 2022 Calder finalist. Right. Um, are we so first of all, like I it's not Michael Bunting's fault that the criteria is what it is, but like, right. can we agree that it should be changed? I, yeah, 100%. that the that the the old rookie is not the same, like, it's nothing, it's not like Michael Bunting did anything wrong, it's not like this takes anything away from Michael Bunting, just yeah, that great season. Look, uh, what Trevor Zegras and what Mo Sider did as a 20 year old defenseman on a bad team was awesome right and like mike again like michael bunting same basically the same age as nathan mckinnon right well and i mean how is he even eligible for this award so he there's there's a couple of he has 26 nhl games played coming into this season but they were in different years right they were in different seasons. You have to have 25 games played in one season. Yeah. That's what so I'm saying. I, I, I actually didn't know that. Yeah. And, and now I think it's even more ridiculous that he's even eligible to be on this ballot. Well, it was like Matt Murray. Uh, you remember Matt Murray when he won two Stanley Cups? His third season in the league was technically his rookie year. Right. He'd won two Stanley Cups already. And then, yeah. and then he was a rookie. What the shit? I don't, I don't love that. So, <laughs> so Bowen Byron played five too many games this year to be yeah. Able Byram to be Byram all their conversation for next year. Byram's rookie eligibility was exhausted at the end. Yeah, um, but which, with Bunting, which just, like which furthers I, just just kind of furthers why this is annoying. Twenty year old Bowen Byram is no longer considered a rookie, but almost twenty seven year old Michael Bunting got to play parts of two seasons with the Arizona Coyotes. Yeah. And then go be a rookie with Toronto. Sign as a free agent, a UFA right. signed as a free agent elsewhere uh, because he was a group six. And 
got to play next to Matthews and Marner. Gets to play next to the Hart Trophy finalist. And like he, dude, he played for Team Canada at the World Championships last summer. Like Michael like Michael Michael Bunting had a great year and he deserves he deserves the credit that he had for the se- the, 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 the for for the season that he had. He had a great year and he like props to that. I don't want to make this look, sound like I'm shitting on Michael Bunting cuz I'm not. No, no. Uh, and if and and ultimately Dude, if he wins it, that's fine. My problem is with the criteria. Like, right. We had the same problem with Kaprizov last year. We had the same problem when Man. Artemi Panarin won it in 2015. Like, and those guys, those guys were both 24. And we were like, come on, this is kind of ridiculous. This guy's been playing pro right. hockey for seven years in Russia. Like, Michael Bunting is 26, man. Yeah. Yeah. He, well, dude, I, that's I mean, crazy he's, to me. It's, cr- it's crazy to be, me. He'll be 27 this year. Yeah, I think I think I think the cutoff should be 23. The old rookie is just weird. Um, yeah, I think it's just no, it, it kind of it, it just kind of goes against it uh, of what you think of as like a best rookie. You know, yeah. And I saw I saw some people trying to there. It was like, oh, his family didn't have enough money, and so he had, you know, he was a slow development, and it was like, like great. He still made it though, okay? We don't need to turn this into like a class thing. And again, he he played 21 games last year. He had 10 yeah. goals. He scored 10 goals in the NHL last season. Like I I, I get it, you know, late bloomer all that stuff, but like where do you draw the line? Yeah, I'm drawing it at 23. I, I think that's a pro because to me, there's a level of the Calder that it's not just that it's your first year in the league, but it's impressive what an impact you were able to make it at a young age. Yeah. And be able to take a big step and play against a bigger, older competition. Michael Bunting would be like the seventh oldest player on the Abs roster. What I would it kind of why it's not written in the in the rules, but I've always the way that I've always looked at the Calder is I do consider their age because yeah. when John Klingberg came into the league and he came in the same year in 2014 as Aaron Eckblad, Aaron Eckblad was an 18 year old playing in a number one role with Florida, and while John Klingberg had better underlyings uh, and similar production, like Aaron Eckblad just had a tougher life. And he was an 18 year old. Right. It was just a it was just a tougher job. And that's kind of what we saw with Mo Sider this year. I'd give this one to Mo Sider, hands down. Uh, yeah, and then too. culturally, Trevor Zegras is by far the most important of these three. Yeah, but I agree. That's not a good reason to give him the call there. <laughs> <laughs> um aj we're up over an hour so let's wrap this up quick uh your norris trophy finalists are kale mccarr roman yossi and victor hedman to me it's a two-horse race i think it will ultimately be kale in the end Uh, i am excited to see who puts mccarr like fourth or fifth on the ballot and screws him yeah 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 yeah. which 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 dude from pittsburgh or boston or tampa bay is gonna Mm -hmm. be the one like which which one of those dudes and when we get to see the votes, this is the stuff that I always go look for is like who had the bold take here. Right. To to leave Makar off or you know, put him at like fourth or fifth, where you're just like, yeah. what the fuck are you talking about? Right, right. Um which Nashville writer is gonna be the one right. that does it, right? That didn't put him on there at all. Yeah. Uh I've got a guess actually at which one. Um <laughs> was he part of the actual voting block uh i don't know i don't know if he was um aj let's just touch real quickly on a couple of the games tonight uh edmonton la la with a chance to close it out back at home no darnell nurse uh what do you think happens here i mean why in god's name would i vote for what i vote for uh have a or have a vote of confidence in edmonton right i yeah I, I look Edmonton is in my opinion Edmonton is the better team they have the better talent this should have been done days ago um the Kings the Kings will have their time it's not now I don't understand it's not it's not like Jonathan Quick has been special in the series do you think just, LA's playing loose we have nothing to lose yeah or... I mean L- LA is 
LA is playing that like we're just happy to be here kind of hockey. Like they're just right. we weren't supposed to be here. Nobody believes in us. We're just gonna go do our thing. And Edmonton plays with all the weight of the world on its shoulders every single night. Yeah. And because I mean, you know, going into the postseason, Mike Smith had four good games, and Mark Spector was writing this whole like Mike Smith is back. <laughs> you know, like you have like that's you know, you're you're like that's the kind of environment that they live in where the pendulum swings only in extremes. Yeah. yeah and there's no... it, yeah, there's there's no middle ground. And that's that's I think where LA has the advantages. Nobody wants anything from them. And the Oilers, the the Oilers fan base, it feels like they are constantly trying to bring back the eighties Oilers. Yeah. Every game. Yeah, they're yeah, they're waiting to see Yari Curry and Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier yeah. and it's not good enough it that they have every single night. It's not good enough that they have three of the last fucking five heart winners. <laughs> um Toronto, Tampa Bay. Look, Toronto, Tampa. I'm, 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 I've rolled with Toronto this entire time. I'm rolling with them now. I think that they've exercised. I think this is when they do it. Um, we'll see. Yeah. No, I mean, it's – they something, something remarkable is going to happen. Uh, either Vasilevsky pushes his uh, win streak to 17 straight after a playoff loss uh, or Edmonton – or excuse me, or Toronto gets over the hump. Uh, last one I want to touch on, uh, Minnesota St. Louis. I think this is the one that everyone will have on their uh, biggest screen tonight. Um, Jared Bednar said he is watching this series very closely right now. Um, St. Louis with a chance to close it out at home. Do you think they get it done? Cam Talbot going in net. Uh, we have a couple different theories that are going to play out tonight. We're going to see, does riding a tandem disrupt your rhythm more than it actually helps or is truly the secret to success in the playoffs having mark andre fleury on your team as long as he's not playing uh what do you think plays out uh i've got uh i've got minnesota winning i'm just gonna stick with the picks that i made before the series and just until until I'm wrong, I'm just going with what I thought was going to happen. I picked this one in seven anyway, so I'm just like, come on. Yeah, I had it in seven as well. Um, it should plus be, it should be another cool. another day off would be cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it's it. No one could confirm this. No one could find the release <laughs> that they were claiming they saw it on. Um, I I talked to some like a official people who would knew who would know. And they were like, Ooh, I was in the call and I know they had like minimum start dates. The rumor around the media room was the NHL has already said that with their TV contracts, they will not start round one until at least Monday, regardless of what happens. Cool for us. That would be great for us. Um, be great for us personally. I don't, like I said, I don't, I'm not going to take that one to the bank yet, but it, it would make sense if ESPN and TNT were like, no, we can't have this kind of loosey goosey sliding scale of when games are starting. Um, you know, I, I, I could, I could see that. So um, we'll see how it all plays out. AJ, uh, Today is Thursday, so we'll be back at it again tomorrow. We will maybe have a series preview to start talking about. We have no clue what we're going to talk about tomorrow because we were saying, ooh, well, maybe a bunch of series will be decided by then, and uh, not a single one has been decided other than abs. Personally, I am hoping that they all go to Game 7 and we just get to have <laughs> two, two epic days of Game 7s. Hey, that'd be great. Uh, I'm already looking forward to tonight because this is the first night of like a full slate of elimination games, teams playing for their lives. Uh, I think that's all we got. Y'all here behind the board. As always, making sure you guys can uh, see us, hear us. Uh, we're sounding good, looking good, all that good stuff. So thank you, Y'all here. Uh, for AJ Hayfley and Y'all here, I am Jesse Montano. Thank you guys all so much for listening. Oh, now Y'all here is not...